Christ. You're welcome. Anybody here Catholic? This is actually the sermon now, or that other was a bonus. I'm assuming you're not Catholic because you would be at a Catholic church, but I was raised not Catholic. So I didn't understand when I would see, and I wouldn't see Catholics do this in real life, it was on television, I actually remember it in a movie, uh, seeing a Catholic say, bless me, Father, for, and, for I have sinned. And I wasn't saved at the time, but I thought, that's a really strange thing to ask to be blessed for, to say, Lord, I would like to be blessed because I've sinned. I knew enough to know that sin was an offense to God, and so I, I, in my mind, I just remember thinking, that of all the times I would ask to be blessed, that wouldn't be the time. <laughs> Lord, I just stole my brother's money and went and bought a Slurpee. Bless me. <laughs> that actually did happen up to the bless me part. I did steal my brother's money once. <laughs> I don't know if he knows that still. He doesn't listen to my sermon, so we're okay. But why would God bless you? Why would you say to God, God, bless me? And we talked last week, and we're going to cover a little bit. I, I, I might have caused as much confusion as I did clarity last week, and that was partly the intention. We need to understand this word blessed because it's so central to what is God. We have to understand what blessed means to understand so many scriptures that talk about blessed. So if we do say, bless me, Father, for whatever reason, we'll know what we're saying and what we're asking. We'll know what other people are saying, or at least what they ought to be. So we had this question last week. What does it mean to be blessed? When you say, bless you, not to a sneeze, but to a, in, a, in a meaningful way. If you ask for God to bless somebody, or if you say that you are blessed, then what does that mean? And we have two pieces here, and if you're uh, confused because you see blessed interpreted as happy, even in your study Bibles, it might say exceedingly happy or filled with happiness. We'll get to that. Because it can mean that, it's just not what it starts meaning. Without the front part of the blessed, the happy part of the blessed won't apply. So the first thing that blessed means is to have found approval from God. To be blessed means that you're rightly positioned before God. So when we looked at the, the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That being poor in spirit isn't the blessing, it's the position before God that means you're actually where you should be, so then whatever else is said can be accurate. So the starting part for blessed is that it is to, be, to have found approval from God. So then we have this a blessing. And that language, depending on the congregation that you're around or the spiritual movement that you're engaged with, you'll hear the word blessing come in a variety of different ways and mean a variety of different things. But what it means in general is something received from God, tangible, spiritual, or experiential. It's something that God has given or done for you. That is what a blessing is. But then we have to figure out, okay, well, if you have received a blessing, then we have the word blessed again. And this is one of the problems with the English language is we use words in multiple ways. So to be blessed, like we said at the top, to have found approval with God, but that doesn't mean that because you received something from God that you're the first one, right? But blessed. So I, I, I got a, I got a, we'll use Eric. He got a new job that he's been wanting. That's a gift from God. But does that mean he has found approval from God? We'd like to think so, and we hope so, but we don't know so. So when you say Eric was blessed with getting a firefighter job, 
So it is to have been blessed with that one thing, but that doesn't mean that he is blessed in terms of right position because somebody else got a firefighter job. I went to his graduation, and there were a bunch of them. And I don't know any of them, so I can't say none of them are in a right position with God, but I'm just going with the odds and saying probably a few were not. Based on a couple of jokes they made, I have some assurance. <laughs> so they got something, the same thing that Eric got, but Eric got something because he had been earnestly seeking the Lord for it. And we're hoping, and that means that he has also found approval with God. That's between Eric and God. So we have this then phrase or verse, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. You guys know this verse. We talked about it last week. And so that that's there. We've got gifts from God, blessings from God. But then, if, if, is that apply to everything? Does everything that we have fit in here? If you're a standard sort of believing American, you would say, oh, absolutely. All of this stuff came from God. But look what the verse says. It says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. It doesn't say everything that you have that you like. It doesn't say everything that you have that you think is good. It's very possible to have stuff that is making you feel good and happy that's not one of those two things a good thing given, or a perfect gift. So our Western mentality tends to ascribe gifting from God just because we have it. That's not accurate. Because if that's accurate, then what God's gifting is, he's very, very preferential towards the West. There's something inherently that he likes about being American or European, and he's not very much into being African, Central American, South American, Eastern Asian. Somehow he bestows pretty nice stuff on some of his children and not on others. Now, to be fair, that's true, but this sermon, like last sermon, is not about money and stuff. I just have to get money and stuff off the table so we can temporarily at least, stop thinking about blessing as stuff. It's probable and possibly likely that we have some stuff that's not a blessing and may in fact put us out of approval with God. But we'll talk about that later. Some of you are going to spin on that the rest of this morning, and I apologize for that. <laughs> I didn't know any way to get out of it. To have received a blessing means that you were blessed, but it doesn't mean you're blessed. If that's confusing, uh, the one we're interested in for today is to have found approval from God. So we go to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. This is the New American Standard. I like to read New American Standard and NIV together because NIV takes some understanding liberties with text. It's accurate, but the New American Standard works harder at staying specific to the individual words. And so at times, while I read an NIV, I read a New American Standard, and this one is in case it matters to you. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the council of the ungodly, yours might say the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. So this is different than the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes is a positive statement on what it means to be blessed. This is saying what blessed people don't do. So it's a different lens, but it's still establishing how to be and have approval from God. For this specific piece here, it says that what we don't do, where we don't stand, where we don't sit, 
And it takes these three positions. Walking. Standing. Sitting. So it has to do with how we position ourselves as we go through life. This text is talking about how we position ourselves with those things and people and circumstances around us. To walk is to travel in a certain way, to, to, to move in a direction of, whereas to, to stand is different. It's to spend some meaningful time in a place, like you stand in a movie line because you're wanting to get in, or you stand and watch a parade go by. You're, you're rooted down and, and engaging the environment more. And to sit is to take up the seat of, to pull a chair in and become part of the circle. So those settings, those positions we take matter because the real question is, who are these people? The ungodly, the sinners, and the scornful. If we can figure out who they are, we can figure out who we're not supposed to do these things with. Walk, stand, and sit. But we've got to figure out who they are. The ungodly first. The ungodly are those who don't know God. It's going to be different from the next line down, which is sinners. The ungodly is simply the group that doesn't know God and thus doesn't have God's counsel. Doesn't have God's understanding of creation. Doesn't have God's understanding of sin and faith and walk with God. So it's giving the caution not to walk with, not to make your common travel under the counsel of those who don't know God. If your desire is to follow God and please Him and be found in a right position with Him, to put yourself where you're receiving counsel from those who don't know God is like going to see a botanist for a medical problem. I've got this problem, so I went to the nursery to find out why my ears keep bleeding. Huh, they couldn't help. They might have said, oh, well, we know this herb. We've got these herbs over here in the herb section. Why don't you try that? Because people try to be helpful, right? They want to help out. They want to apply the knowledge that they have to help you with this problem. So your ears keep bleeding, and that's troublesome. And so you go and talk to the nursery person, and they've got these herbs that they heard sometime, somewhere, might help with bleeding ear syndrome. I'm making this part up. <laughs> How smart would it be to take that advice? Now, one could argue, well, you know, there's some knowledge out there that, that no, some people don't have, and maybe those people with plants got something right. But if my ears are bleeding, I'm going to the doctor. I'm going to go talk to a medical professional because their job is medical professions and ears bleeding fits under that umbrella, even though the other person might sound right. We listen too frequently to people's advice, television, magazines. I was reading an article from a counselor, a psychologist in a magazine. And I was like, why? This is, some, this is pretty good advice. If you want to die miserable and horribly bad. Because they were talking from a worldly perspective. And it, the article happened to be about dating. And I, because I, was, I, I, I do psychology, used to it with my high school kids. I read stuff because I want them to be able to read things. And it was about dating. It was some of the worst advice on the planet if you're a believer. It was great advice if you just want to be very experienced as a is a there's a dater <laughs> trying to keep it so the kids can listen <laughs> the world is ungodly we have to be very careful not to walk in their counsel or we will not be blessed that's what this first one's talking about realize that the majority of the world's advice and counsel is not godly so don't listen to it so the next one is to stand in the path of sinners. Well, who are these sinners? Sinners are people who openly defy God, who 
knowledgeably choose to reject God and his precepts, the things that God wants of you. Now remember, to be blessed is to be in a right position with God. These people intentionally don't do that. They make a conscious choice to disregard God. Now, th this might seem obvious that we shouldn't stand in the path of sinners, but, but what does that actually mean? It doesn't say, don't be a sinner. It's assuming that's clear. But to stand in the path of sinners means that you're going and placing yourself in a place where you are observing and in the presence of what is not God. That you're making a choice to engage in... I've heard this lots of times. I've done this lots of times. I'm a Christian. I know this is bad stuff, so I'm not going to engage in it. But I'm okay because the Holy Spirit will protect my heart. I'm going to just... See what's going on. I'm going to spend time with these people and just try to be a witness to them. Dorm life is the thing that comes to my mind. You're going and putting yourself in a place where people are intentionally and knowingly breaking the rules. I don't know if you ever went to a dorm. I only spent one year, barely got out. <laughs> because the intention there was to defy God. It wasn't written down. It didn't have it like, you know, above the doors, defy God. <laughs> All you had to do is open the fridge. <laughs> Check your license. They didn't line up. We can put ourselves in places where we are in the path, in the walkway, and what happens, remember what Scripture says about bad company? What does it do? It corrupts good morals. That desire to please God slowly erodes because our desire to please people is amazingly powerful and subtle. And so what this is warning of is if you want to be blessed by God, that you're not going to take the advice and counsel of the ungodly, and you're not going to walk and stand and be in the path with people who are choosing to defy God. Not in a, necessarily an overt way, but if you do stand in that path, you will become like those who traveled that path. What it's trying to get us to understand is we have to make a choice about where we position ourselves. And how we engage not just our small little arena here at church, but how we engage everywhere. How we choose to position ourselves with people and events. The third one is to not sit in the seat of the scornful. That's kind of a hard word, isn't it? Scornful. Judy and I went to the beach the other day for a few days and okay. coming home we you come through Aberdeen and Hoquiam is that the other little yeah. podunk town sorry oh. <laughs> there's a little uh, diner no what is it it's like a drive-in when we're coming home there's a little drive-in hamburger place there we stop there every time when we're coming home uh, they got good burgers and great milkshakes if you want to know I'll tell you later where it's at we got our order placed, and then you have to get standing. It's beautiful. It's on this little river. There's tugboats across the river, and it's, it's just a great place. We're standing outside watching the tugboats and sitting there, and, and I listened to this conversation start up. There's four or five people, adults, in the parking lot behind us, and, I, and one of them says, this is, you can check with my wife. This is verbatim. There's so much animosity in our world. And you hear a couple of knowing, oh, yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. It's the Republicans, is what they said. The guy said, it's the Republicans that are doing this. To which the others said, yeah, it is those Republicans. 
Now, it's a fairly quiet audience right now because there might be some Republicans in the House, and if you are, that's good, and I'm not, uh, not saying that they're right. That's not my point. About a week later, I'm with a group of people, and I bear witness. There is so much, and they need to change the word strife in America right now. It's the Democrats. Those Democrats are so divisive. They won't get behind the policies that we know we need to do. And exact same conversation, just the words were changed. One group, it's the Republicans. Another group, it's the Democrats. And they were passionate that they were so right. Abs those Republicans. Democrats. They might as well have been saying demons. That's the vehemence which they were communicating with. And these were very educated people. The word scornful or mockers, if it is in your text, defiant and cynical free thinkers, in contrast, an antagonism to the wise. The root principle of their character is a spirit of proud self-sufficiency. That's out of the dictionary, Bible dictionary for the, what this word actually means. I've met and been this. So sure I'm right that I'm willing subtly to mock somebody who might disagree with me. How could anyone believe that? We run this risk. This is a text that's written to followers of God. Spirit of proud self-sufficiency. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. We don't have that right. Even if we're right. To position ourselves as the one to cast judgment on an individual, a system, a society, a religion, anything. What we do have a right to do is testify to the truth of Jesus Christ. But what this is warning is don't put yourself in the seat where you're self-righteous, judgmental, accusational, the only person right in the room. Because what happens is you're outside of God when you do that. You're saying you're the expert on everything. I do believe it's the Democrats' fault. <laughs> Just as much as I believe it's the Republicans' fault. And the socialists and the communists and the atheists and the Christians because we've all taken up our positions and said you can join me or leave me alone. I've asked the Lord several times if I'm supposed to bring this up and each time he has said I'll let you know. I don't know why. So there's no slide here of a Facebook post but About under a year around this time, I mentioned this. Not because I'm right, but because I am worried about walking in the counsel of the ungodly. We immersed ourselves a decade ago in social media and have given ourselves over to the inputs and arguments of the ungodly. And we're some of them. When we're engaged in spouting our beliefs, whatever it is you believe, it doesn't matter if you're pro-abortion or anti-abortion. It doesn't matter if you're pro-gun or anti-gun. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, or you're a Bernie Sanders fan or you're a Donald Trump fan. It doesn't matter if you're any of those. We have immersed ourselves in a filterless, amoral system. And I'm just going to say, I don't think we should. 
we compromise our witness and we corrupt our mind because we're standing in the path of sinners and we're sitting in the seat of the scornful. If you're using Facebook or whatever other book it might be to post your birthday and say, hey, I love you, and, and, and hey, we're going to the park today, great, keep doing it. But if you're engaged in social media as your voice, I'm going to ask you to ask the Lord, is that okay? With the suggestion that I don't think he's going to say yes. And I'll leave that to you. His delight, the one who's blessed, is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. What this is saying is if you want to be rightly positioned before God, don't wrongly position yourself with people and society. Don't engage in society in a way that isn't from God. It's saying that if you want to be in a right position with God, your delight should be in what God says, the law of the Lord. We're going to talk about the Beatitudes next week, but we talked about it a little bit last week and this week. See how that is? Well, let's go back. Blessed is his, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Look at what Matthew 5, 6 says right in the middle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's the same thing. Your desire is to be right before God. How do you find out what's right before God? Right here. A right understanding of Scripture. An understanding of what God says we should be. And a desire for that to become us. Not that it is us, but it will become us. What Seth did today is a, is a model of that. Something's wrong. I want to get it right. I'm going to do what I need to do. That's what's required of all of us. Billy Graham said if he could do one thing different, it would be what? I would repent more. I would repent more. On his law, he meditates day and night. I don't. I'm getting better. That doesn't mean that you walk around with your Bible in front of your face all the time. It means that when you're learning things that are from the Bible, that you continue to mull on those and talk to the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to grow you and lead you throughout the day. Lord, I want to become that. If you haven't been part of Sunday school, that's, that's, that's where Romans 6, 7, up to 8 leads to is Paul going, I, I, just, I keep messing this up and messing it up. What a wretched man am I. If it weren't for the Holy Spirit, I'd be lost. That's what this is about. Now, if you want to understand the happy, why it says in some of your Bibles, happy, blessed. The Hebrew is the word esher. says to translate it as happiness or contentment, which is true. It sometimes is in your Bibles. But look what the, the uh, word comes from. Esher comes from the Hebrew word ashar, which means to be straight or to be right. See, the background behind blessed, that if you want the I've been blessed with peace and happiness, it has to start with I'm in the right place, going the right direction with my life. They connect. That's why the translations try and overlap that and get us to understand it. If you want to be happy and fulfilled and exactly what God wants you to be, you have to be exactly where God wants you to be, going where he wants you to go. That's what it is. So that's why blessed can be a little confusing. If you don't understand in a right place, you'll never get to the happy, peaceful thing that God does in your life. So it ends. The scripture goes on, but we're not going to spend time with the, the last few verses. But verse 3 says, He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. That's the blessing from being blessed. I'm going to be like a tree planted by rivers of water. Now, the mistake we make, and when we talk later about wealth and finances and all this stuff is, we start to think that that tree not only is going to grow apples, that's what it says later, brings forth its fruit in the season. We think that trees grow apples and cars and boats and stuff. Nonsense. There are things about living in the Western world that God certainly is, uh, uh, has allowed but we've got a lot of work to do on understanding what the responsibility is with what he's allowed us to have. 
But that's not the blessing. The blessing is feeling like a tree planted by streams of water. Bless me, Father, should mean, God, I want to be right with you because I know you created me and only you can give me happiness and peace. So if I'm blessed, then I'll be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.